Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. What does it mean to forgive? And is there a way to do it that truly works? Why is it essential to practice forgiveness in your life, especially in your relationship? And how does the practice of forgiveness change when it's something big you're trying to forgive versus the everyday things? Did you even know that forgiveness can help you get through the everyday ups and downs of life with your partner? In relationship, it's inevitable. Big or small, one of you is going to hurt the other. So then the question is, what do you do? How do you repair and find your way to forgiveness? In today's episode, we're going to explore the topic of forgiveness in detail with one of the world's experts on the topic, Dr. Fred Luskin, director of the Stanford Forgiveness Project and author of the books Forgive for Love, The Missing Ingredient for a Healthy and Lasting Relationship, and Forgive for Good, which are both eye-opening journeys into how the process of forgiveness works in the context of life and love. Fred Luskin has worked with couples and has also worked with people who have survived terrorist attacks or from war-torn countries, so his forgiveness methodology covers a wide range of the human experience. You can find the detailed show notes for this episode at neilsatin.com slash forgive. And if you download the guide or text the word passion to the number 33444, You'll also qualify to win a free signed copy of one of Fred's books. Fred Luskin, thank you so much for being here with us today on Relationship Alive. Oh, thank you. Good intro. Yeah, and there's, there's as I mentioned, so much to talk about. And I'm wondering if we could start with simply a... Um, just defining what, like, because when I talk to people about the importance of forgiveness, it's like everyone kind of gets it, at least on this altruistic, or maybe they heard about forgiveness in their church or synagogue or mosque or something. But when it comes to the actual brass tacks of practicing forgiveness, I think a lot of people end up being stymied or clueless or feeling like, well, You know, I forgave this person, but it still hurts like hell, and I'm not sure what to do about it. Or I don't know if I can forgive because this person won't apologize. So I'm wondering if you could take a moment to just share with us your perspective on what forgiveness is and what it isn't. You know, I can do that. My first response to you is that people don't want to forgive that it's not just that they're confused about it <clears throat> and that they have some misconceptions. It's, it's, it's hard to battle away the, the, the power of our self-absorption. And, and forgiveness is a challenge to that. It's, it's saying maybe that the relationship matters more or harmony matters more or doing the right thing matters more, or owning one's weaknesses matters more. But generally speaking, that's a tough thing, is, is for the, the ego or the selfish center to say, well, even though you might have harmed me, um, I'm going to release that vision of you as, as somebody who does harm. And... and but that's not a highly desired thing. I mean, I've even noticed culturally that there are, like even even the spiritual kind of qualities that we look at culturally are, are now, I see mindfulness becoming huge and even, even the self-compassion piece because those are about often about the self. And forgiveness says, you know, maybe I've been listening to this self a little too much. And that's a big challenge. So when we talk about forgiveness, um, is, it, is it necessary to have someone on the other end of forgiveness saying, I'm sorry? It certainly makes it a lot easier, but it's not necessary. Um, you know, you asked before, what's the definition of forgiveness? Mm-hmm. We have a simple definition of forgiveness, and that's um, 
you know, making peace when you didn't get what you want. Mm. And so um, the, the whole nub of it is somehow that, you know, you or I wanted a certain outcome and then that outcome didn't occur. And then how do you, how do you reconcile your desire for something with reality? That, that's what forgiveness is. Right. And uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what you're and what you mentioned earlier is that it's easy to be caught in a habit of wanting to dwell or stay in in the hurt, in the blame um, versus whatever it takes to release that feeling. I don't, I don't know that it's just a habit for at, 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 at the initial experience um, grief is is a necessary experience the the sense of ouch i didn't get what i wanted or i didn't i i didn't experience love the way i wanted that's that's hard and 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 all of us is wired to suffer that way the other piece is that um you know understanding chain or understanding what happened requires usually creating some new cognitive schema around events such as instead of like they owed me um, a new cognitive schema at some level as you mature is I don't always get what I want or in order to make a long-term relationship work I have to accommodate the fact that this is a flawed human being well, th those are entirely different schemas that hopefully can grow from more immature and inadequate schemas, such as this person owes me anything I want, or anytime I want sex, I get it, or anytime I want anything, I get it. And so the immaturity of those schemas gets replaced, but that takes time. And so there's always going to be a, a, like some period of hurting that's not necessarily maladaptive. And so what you're saying is that you you have to experience that grief on yeah. some level in order to get to the forgiveness stage. Well, to grow. Right. Because most much of the grief is formed by... Um, inept or, or not useful schemas of how life should be and those often get shown not to work and some of the wise among us use that as an opportunity to grow. Some of the non-wise use it as an opportunity to be bitter. I mean it's, it's, um, it, it's a choice that we have throughout our whole life. So I'm curious your um your process for for forgiving does it shift a lot based on the kinds of things that you're forgiving not at all in fact the easiest way to practice forgiveness is on the little things if you want to become more forgiving in relationship you choose minor things that your partner does that you don't like and that's where you practice, so you develop the skill, and that you create the mental representations of what that means, so that when bigger things come, you've already practiced or created like the brain pathways that you're going to use. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think you even compare it to developing a muscle and how yes. Im how important it is to to have this totally different pathway for yeah. how you confront um, disappointment. It, Think about the, the dramatic ignorance that many people have when they enter relationship. One, they think that they're fine, which is a ridiculous <laughs> assumption, right? You know, they, they, they think that, that their own idiosyncratic nuttiness is not going to impact another human being. So that's like the first, like, like very out of touch. And then they, they think that the weirdness, wackiness, bad habits, crazy thoughts, 
you know, patterns that were set down by families. They think that there's something unusual about that in their particular partner. That, like, somehow this partner is damaged as opposed to that's the way it is. We're all damaged. And we're just damaged in different ways. And, and so they come into relationships with so little real ability to work it out because they're coming in with these like ludicrous ideas of their own adequacy and the uniqueness of their partner's inadequacy. I'm sensing the recipe for problems in well, that look, in that setup. Look, look at what we have. I mean, a, a divorce rate of close to 50%, not quite. And the most interesting statistic on those is that the divorce rate for second and third marriages is higher than that for first marriages. And I think the data is that only about 30% of couples are actually happy with each other. Yeah, that's sobering. And yeah. of course, our mission on the podcast here is to boost that percent by at least a few percentage points. Uh, of so, course. Yeah, yeah. And so that being said, I mean, it's interesting. I came across your work uh, for the first time when I was reading Catherine Woodward Thomas's book, Conscious Uncoupling. Of course. So, um, you know, uh, no better place to learn forgiveness than in the context of an ending in in uh, relationship. But that being said, one of the important principles that she stresses in her book and she's talked about on the show and that you talk about is really how you, it's like this process of shifting perspective where you're really taking responsibility for your part in your own life. Um, like that that's an essential way of shifting away from, from just blaming others for your problems. Absolutely. And that's at the heart of forgiveness, that my nervous system, my moods, my brain, they're up to me, not my partner. And yeah. even though my partner sends out incredible information and stimulus, you know, and sometimes they can be absolutely close to deranged, um, I'm still responsible for figuring out how to handle my own life. And and that's a really challenging thing. That's what that's that's what forgiveness can lead to, like some efficacy that I can handle my life. And if you don't practice that, then you become fearful of what other people bring to you and fearful of relationship, which is what you see all over the place. Like, I've been harmed, and that, I mean, that would be what, you know, colloquially we refer to as baggage. Fred, I'm curious to know if you could talk for a minute about the big things that can happen to us. So, not just the little hurts, but something big that well, just really sucked. How do we reclaim our power and our choice after those kinds of things happen to us? I'm certainly careful to make clear that we don't know that, you know, the laws of this material world seem to be very orderly. And so it's not so likely that everything that we don't like is chaos. We just don't know that. So that said... Just remembering that can be helpful, that we, we just don't know the way this thing is organized. Then, when, let, let's say that you do decide, though, for whatever it's worth, that even if this is somehow, like, woven into the tapestry of no mistakes are made, it still really, really sucked. And there was nothing about it that I would have chosen, had chosen in any capacity to and it was a devastating blow. Those are feelings and, and cognitions that are very common on planet Earth. And what you have to be careful with is not to exaggerate the experience that you're having as if it's unusual. So even if, say, even if you don't buy that there's some lawfulness to it, you certainly have to buy that it's common. 
And it's, it may actually be one of the aspects of being a human being that we all have to struggle to deal with. And, and, and just, just reframing it a little more truthfully, which is, yes, maybe my daughter was raped or maybe my partner you know, left me when I was eight months pregnant to go have an affair with somebody cuter. I mean, I'm just... So the individual wounding may be distinct, but in the big picture, the amount of human wounding from either accidents or human unkindness is staggering. And you want to look at the propensity that we all have to only focus on our own and not see the universality of it, those two qualities cause incredible extra suffering for all of us. I'm does, that, does, that, does that help you reposition this a little? It does, and I'm, I'm reminded a bit of the, the practice of Tonglen and connecting your suffering and your, the specific naming of your suffering to all the other people in the world who are experiencing that as a way of helping uh, take away some of its charge and power. Well, it's not just taking away the charge, it's seeing the truth. Mm. You know, even just taking away the charge can be like a self-absorbed kind of thing. But there's something powerful in a positive direction of seeing that difficulty and obstacles and change are part of life. There's no way, there's no way to pull that out. And so you have to make a decision as to how strong and capable you want to be of dealing with this stuff. And so what I'm getting from what you're saying is that that decision is, am I going to, in my present life, let those things have power over me and affect my ability to live a positive life, to connect to others, to maybe affect change in the world around those things, around those sufferings. And to love. Yeah. Because so much of the reason why couples blow up is everybody's been hurt and everybody has a lot of anger. And we're all looking for some place to put that anger. And so when we find something wrong with our partner... Part of us is just giving vent to the vague existence of our frustration that exists way before we had a partner. And, and so we're looking for something to blame for our dissatisfaction. And it, it, that, that's just an omnipresence. And, and we can use as ammunition to defend our unkindness all the unkindness done to us. It's an endless stream. Or we can make some kind of decision that within the world, in its incredible difficulty, and even my own life, I'm still going to try to be a loving person. And that brings us back, I think, to your, your definition, your simple definition of forgiveness. Yeah. Which is how you... How you deal, and, and I'm going to even maybe add how you make the inevitable disappointments of life something that doesn't hold you back from your growth and happiness. Well, that even facilitates it because um, if, if, if I'm with somebody who hurts me, one of the things, and this doesn't mean you have to stay with them, but one of the things to remember is it's spot on certain that you've hurt them. So that's, there's a humility and a truth to that, that yes, they've hurt you and you've hurt them. Okay. They're flawed. Absolutely. Well, I'm flawed. So how do two flawed people get along? Not how does, you know, my highness myself deal with a wayward subject, which is the way many people take this. So they don't have a, a right attitude about it. They don't see things clearly. And they think somehow, look, somebody's doing something to them 
rather than the difficulty, the true difficulty, of two people trying to navigate past their weaknesses to love each other. And that's an incredibly noble pursuit. And essential, I think, to a long-term relationship that lasts and isn't ultimately miserable. Yeah. So how does this tie in to the process that you've developed for forgiveness and for teaching people how to actually find that Release. Well, I could, I could make that very simple. I mean, after all these years, you can't actually push forgiveness. Like the word makes people recoil. Um, but what you could do is kind of sneak around and get them to be much more likely to forgive. So the at this point, the four practices that we use, which are generic practices, is first, everybody has to calm down. So... It, you quiet down. I, and I remember 15 years ago giving a talk at one of the Gottman conferences in Seattle and saying this, that, you know, that, that at the essence of marital therapy, at the essence of getting along with another human being, is calm yourself down. <laughs> like, take a breath, relax, take a walk, do something, chill. Because the part of your brain that's all adrenalized, you don't want it's just going to make everything worse. The part of your brain that's quieter may actually be an ally to you. So that's one thing. So quiet down. We, we call it pert practice. But you know, relax. Do practices that gentle and calm your nervous system. Two, um, see the good in whatever it is that you're dealing with and your life so you don't exaggerate the bad. I mean, that's just such a simple value, but it works so deeply. So even if, even if you, again, you're in a bad marriage, it doesn't mean you have a bad life. You may have a bad marriage, but you can still appreciate the fact that you have food and clothing and shelter and opportunity and health. There's no end to what you can appreciate that will help the statements you make about your bad partner be more accurate and truthful. And that's crucial. You know, I, I've done couples therapy and it can be a really ugly experience. Um, I, I remember, I'm going to say 20 years ago when I started doing this stuff, I remember sitting in a room with a distressed couple and they were just vulgar you know they were just so filled with bitterness and contempt and I mean you know the Gottman's talk about how contempt is the killer for relationship and mm -hmm. I'm sitting there thinking and and each of these people is without humor acting terribly towards the, each other, blaming the other person for the fact that they're a deranged, out-of-control person. And they're not laughing at themselves. That was one. But then the second was, and, and this is the person they pledged to do their best to. How do they treat those they didn't make that pledge to? And, and I thought, wow, this is so distorted. I didn't have the skills then to know you just wade right in there and you get people to meditate and relax and quiet and then they talk. But I didn't know that then. Mm. But you got to calm yourself down and you have to find good. So I would have now, it would be like, hey, you may not like your partner, but I want to hear what you like about your life because I don't want you poisoning yourself with your negativity so that you can't even see your life clearly. Um, the third is very simple, just cognitive restructuring or reframing, which is, hey, at some level, you don't always get what you want. I mean, and then there are very simple practices that tease that out. Like, you don't get everything you want. That's just a given. Now, how do you use that information? And the last is you have to get out of and alter the victim story. So the victim story is simply a perspective. It's not deep truth. It's just it's just one take on a situation. 
and you've gotten stuck in this take. Like, you know, the, you're, you're stuck in your perspective and the story you've constructed around it. That's your prison. So you've got to alter the story. So I would just work on those things. I'm not that interested in their complaints. I'm interested in helping them get some quiet and clarity so that they can access the part of their brain that isn't so enmeshed in the battle. And that's that in that part of the brain, forgiveness just lives. It's not, it's not an unusual experience when you're not full of adrenaline and when you're not full of a story that posits somebody you're living with as your mortal enemy. It's, it's a natural response to life, but you have to cultivate conditions that bring out that natural response. Could you talk for a moment about the um, the PERT practice? I'm I think we may have on I, and I can't remember which episode it was. I think we might have talked about something similar um, along the lines of heart centered breathing, um, and it so it seems very similar. But maybe you could just describe how it's how it's done from your perspective. Well, I mean, there's no one right way to do this stuff. Right. You know, I mean, you understand what I'm saying. I mean. The psychophysiology of relaxation has nothing to do with my naming a technique or anybody else's. This stuff has been known for thousands of years. Um, what I tried to do was fig just figure out a way to directly calm the nervous system. And so you, you, know, you do the basic meditation technique of bringing your attention to your abdomen and inhaling deeply, but making sure your abdomen expands because that's how you grab the parasympathetic arousal and have it calm the sympathetic arousal. And then when you've taken a few breaths where you consciously open your belly to welcome the air in and you expand, then you just bring an image to your mind of something loving and positive and that quiets down your nervous system, the breathing and the positiveness. And then it's like your nervous system gets a reset. So at that moment of calm, you have bandwidth that you didn't have 30 seconds before. When you're adrenalized or angry, you have almost no bandwidth. You're, you're stuck on a predetermined course, and you're just going to say the same stereotypical things that you've said to yourself forever because that's what adrenaline does the minute you drain the adrenaline out of the system you then like you get a do-over and you can say oh okay now that I'm starting fresh do I want to go back to contempt do I want to try something else it, it's it's just reminding us that you have a choice and it's that choice as the mindfulness teachers understand that's where you get some freedom. Like, I have a choice how upset I get. I, I, I still may choose to leave my partner, but as long as I'm blaming them for the action of my nervous system, it's going to be very hard to have any clarity. So um, one suggestion I'd like to offer for those people listening that's worked really well with my clients is to choose that image ahead of time like to know like maybe after after you're done listening to this episode figure out what that loving the the image that that evokes feelings of love and gratitude and joy for you because that it can be really challenging to come up with that image when you're in that um that triggered place um and i'm wondering if you could offer also some thoughts on, so you get to that calmed down place. Now you're in a, now you're able to make more, more sense of what's actually going on. And um, can you, can you offer an example of, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're, and they're like, what do you mean? Like my partner did X and, and that's making me feel like shit. So like, how do I, you know, how would I tease that apart for someone? I mean, we, we did this, these practices with mothers who had their children murdered. So it's not just for 
bad marriages or, or difficult couple situations. When, when you're just sitting there minding your own business and a thought comes to your head about, wow, my, my partner said that? And then you find yourself enraged. You're telling yourself, my partner did that, comes not just, like, it's not just a, a, a one thought that's gentle and kind of sneaks in there. It's my partner did that, and there's a whole host of suppositions that partners should never do that. And a partner who does that should be punished. And a partner who does that is unconscionably bad. It's not just that one thing. It has associations and it has rules around it. So then when your nervous system gets agitated because the partner has done such a terrible thing and you've just reminded yourself what a terrible thing it was, you have many choices that you don't remember. One is you could simply see it and you ooh, here I am getting upset again. That's silly. We've been broken up for three months. Why am I bothering with this? Or, hmm, I'm getting upset again. Well, I've been upset now 500 times over this. That's enough. Or, I'm getting upset again. Wouldn't it be nice to have another way to deal with this? So, it's, it's not, we've made habits out of things that don't have to be so limited in their, in their response repertoire. So, let's say you do get upset again then the normal response is to say, wow, I'm upset because they did that terrible thing. But the, the deeper truth is I'm upset because I practiced certain kinds of thinking and being that lead me to be upset, and then I blame something that they did in the past for why I'm upset, and therefore, I lose the opportunity to quiet myself down because it's their fault. So all that's going on under the surface, and people are not paying attention to that, so they feel helpless. It's the helplessness that is so dangerous for us. If you had efficacy when you got upset, you'd just say, oh, okay, I'm upset. Now, if it's two weeks after your, your, your partner cheated on you, then... You feel the upset because it's an awful thing. But if it's two years after your partner left or cheated on you, it's a waste of your time. It, it's In fact, it's dangerous because it's, it's prejudicing your ability to, to live successfully. And so that, that temporal thing is in there, and then there's some sense of what kind of life do you want? And how much power do you want to give over so you can see this in couples as their relationship is deteriorating. The negativity and contempt become stronger and stronger, and the couple's capacity to choose otherwise gets weaker and weaker. And you can just see that happening. I'm, I, one thing that I found really um, insightful in your book, Forgive for Love, um, and by the way, just to mention to our listeners that Fred has offered to give away one of his books. We don't yet know which one. It's whatever happens to be on his shelf <laughs> when he gets to the office. But he is is delighted to give it away to a lucky listener. If you're interested in qualifying, then uh, download the show guide at neilsatin.com slash forgive. Or uh, you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and just follow the instructions and that will qualify you to win a free signed copy of one of Fred Luskin's books. And I can tell you that um, Forgive for Love is a very powerful read, very practical. One of the concepts that really made an impact on me was this, and you just mentioned it, sort of, um, is this idea about rules that you have and and i think you call them unenforceable rules so could you explain quickly what those are and and how someone well, can figure out what they are for them well an unenforceable rule in in certainly in this definition is a demand that you have for other people that you can enforce so you could tell your partner you know don't ever lie to me but you can't enforce that. They decide whether they lie. And you can tell your partner, be home at 8 
and don't drink, that they make that decision. So we, it's, it's, it's a rule that shows up when we get really upset because when you get really upset, you're reducing your ability to deal with something successfully. So if you want your partner to stop drinking, then it's better to be level-headed and recognize that I may have married an alcoholic and it's probably a good idea to get out. But if you get upset, it's because they've broken a rule that you could never have enforced in the first place, which is futile. And so one of the values is to recognize when it is that I'm engaged in such a futile pursuit, because then you can stop. And then you can create better expectations for yourself, which generally are more about either things that are reasonable for them to do, or the expectations are how you're going to deal successfully with yourself. And and so unenforceable, like the... the the, the way I used to teach this when, it, when I was just thinking about this is you can wake up in the morning and want the sun to rise in the west all you want. But if you get pissed because it rises in the east, that's as stupid as getting pissed because an alcoholic drinks. I mean, it's just that's what they do. Sun rises in the east, alcoholics drink. But you can have rules that make it wrong that simply enrage your nervous system but don't ever help you deal with it. Yeah, so what would be an example of, you know, when you see I have this I have this rule that, you know, my partner shouldn't drink or my partner should always do their dishes or yeah, my exactly. partner should have sex with me when I want to have sex with them. Exactly. What's an example of how you would step away from that rule once you've seen it and create a realistic expectation? Well, the, 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 the most important piece is when you're very upset and you're not in like really immediate danger, then you know there's an unenforceable rule in there that's been broken. That if somebody's coming at you with a butcher knife, get upset. It's like, that's good. <laughs> if somebody really threatens to harm one of your children, get upset. I mean, you know, like this is not suggesting that people become passive about everything. But if you're in the middle of the same argument you've had 46,000 times and you're upset, it's an unenforceable rule, which is a waste of your time. So the first thing to recognize is something's going on in my head that's not helping me. Then the, the next piece, the most helpful piece, is to step away, even if it's just psychically, and take a deep breath. That you don't have to step away from the person, but there are simple strategies of Turn your body away from them just so you can breathe without the influence of this like arousal and take a deep breath and just like do something to just quiet down that extra arousal. Then like ask yourself seriously, like, do they have to do what I want? And the answer is no, always. So then, well, what do I do to, 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 to take care of myself? I mean, it's really, what do I do to take care of myself? And it's usually something to do with, well, calm down, get away, talk reasonably, ask. Like, cur be curious. Like, do you really think it's okay to drink? Do you really think it's okay to cheat? But whatever this is will help you calm down. And then you got your brain back. And if you do this regularly, it's called forgiveness, which is I'm no longer just getting upset. I'm no longer blaming you. I'm taking back control of myself so I can, I can have a more successful life. I mean, that's, that's what the forgiveness piece does. Yeah, and I think in that place, you end up seeing all the nuances where you may decide that a partner who actually can't stop cheating on you isn't someone you want to be with. But you might decide that a partner who never makes the bed, even though it really annoys you, that that's something you can live with. Well, the, the, the absolute truth is there's going to be lots of things that you're going to have to live with. And, you know, the research on successful couples is 
that forgiveness is one of those top qualities that facilitates a successful relationship. Because even if there's nothing obviously wrong with your partner, the interaction effect of two people trying to sort it out is going to create all sorts of conflict because your expectations are different, your upbringing is different, your temperament is different, your biological rhythms are different. It's the integration of two people into a functioning unit is very hard. And so there's, there's going to be grinding of the gears, even if you guys really love each other. But the, the, the piece that if you, if you use it to build up ammunition about what's wrong with your partner, then you're going to sabotage your own chance of having success. If you use it to recognize that there's many places, as Gottman says, that we're just not going to get along. We're simply not going to work this out. And that we have to make peace with the fact that in this area we're different. But that's a form of forgiveness also. The other piece is there are some areas that you will work out, but it's, again, you're not going to work it out so easily if your mental space is that they're wrong. If, you're, if your attitude is they're different, and this is the person that I chose in their differentness, like I made this specific human being my choice, then you have a better chance of working it out. It makes makes total sense because then you're actually in a conversation with that person and and it seems like in that space there's the potential for change even around something like someone who doesn't do the dishes well and you know here's what makes human beings so fascinating is you know you could get upset because they don't do the dishes or you could get upset because they do the dishes too quickly or you could get upset because they have special dishes that they make sure they bring out every time. Or you could get upset because, um, you know, you want to sit and watch TV and they want to do the dishes now. It's, it's not just that there's something wrong with the partner. It's the relationship between the partner and our expectations and our history and training. It's when those get into conflict. Yeah, and your your fourth step that you mentioned earlier about altering the victim story and, and recognizing that it's just a perspective, you, you detail this more in Forgive for Love, the practice of creating a really positive story about Absolutely. that you tell about your relationship. Absolutely. Well, the, the, in, in terms of couples, the frame that I think is the most important is what a remarkable thing it is that somebody would try to love me. That just that framing is so profound that what a remarkable thing that as flawed and as difficult as I am, somebody would take me on. And, and, and from that grows the kind of humility and and, and whatever it is that allows us to be in relationship in a certain way. Well, Fred Luskin, thank you so much for being on our show today to talk about forgiveness. And I can't recommend your book, Forgive for Love, enough. The subtitle is The Missing Ingredient for a Healthy and Lasting Relationship. And I do agree with you that it's such an important part of people finding that path to actually thriving and growing together and and succeeding in in this project of loving each other in all our flaws and and imperfections. So thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. Good job. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. 
And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.